from the civilian uh, government who have been detained for them to be released. And of course, a strong, universal call uh, for the military to refrain from violence uh, against peaceful protesters, uh, seeking nothing more than the restoration uh, of their democratic aspirations. My question was about Feltman, Special Envoy Feltman's call with the Egyptian Foreign Minister Shukri. Do you have anything specific to say about that call? The or, or anything specific to say about what role Egypt might have played in encouraging or discouraging uh, uh, General Burhan's act? Uh, look, we're not going to be in a position to read out uh, every call, but um, as I've said before, uh, we have engaged uh, with a number of our partners, including Sudan's neighbors, uh, to establish a common position uh, and to make sure that uh, the Sudanese military hears our collective voice okay. uh, very well, clearly. Do you have a common uh, position with Egypt right now? Well, so Egypt, and, and I will just uh, note here what Egypt has said publicly. I will lead, leave it to uh, our partners in Cairo to um, uh, to speak for their position, but what they've uh, said publicly is uh, they're working to ensure stability, security. Um, uh, they are closely following uh, these uh, events. Uh, they are looking at the safety of the Sudanese people. Uh, so we are working closely well, with uh, our Egyptian well, partners, that, just as we are with, uh, with well, other Well, that's neighbors. fine, but that is a far cry from your absolute condemnation, demand for the immediate release of all political actors, uh, an end to, uh, you know, repression, suppression of, of protests. So uh, can you say at this point, honestly, can you say if the Egyptians are on board with your, with your, with, with your position? Matt, I, I'm not going to speak for other countries. Uh, I will just speak for the United States. Uh, and uh, we are speaking uh, with partners, uh, with allies around the world, uh, including Sudan's neighbors, uh, okay. to establish a common position and to do all we can. Uh, to see to it that democracy is restored in Sudan. Last one, in terms of consequences um, beyond the, uh, since yesterday when you announced the suspension or the pause in the 700 million uh, in ESF, has there been any um, movement on suspending or not suspending? I saw the USAID statement that their humanitarian assistance will continue, but of course that wouldn't be affected by uh, humanitarian aid is not affected by the, any kind of restrictions. So has there been any movement uh, or developments in terms of assistance? Well, so I want to be uh, very clear on, on that point, and we've had an occasion to speak to this in other contexts recently. Uh, but we always differentiate uh, between bilateral assistance uh, and humanitarian assistance, the latter category uh, going to support the people, uh, in this case, uh, the Sudanese people. And state uh, and USAID, we maintain a significant uh, humanitarian portfolio uh, and a growing uh, development portfolio when it comes to Sudan uh, in this past fiscal year, the fiscal year that ended uh, at the end of last month. Uh, the United States provided $60 million in bilateral health and development, development assistance to Sudan, uh, focused on supporting democracy, supporting human rights and governance, food security, civic engagement, conflict mitigation, and global health assistance. Uh, in addition, we provided more than $400 million, $438 million, uh, to be precise, in life-saving humanitarian assistance uh, to Sudan in the last fiscal year. Uh, the $60 million of bilateral health and development assistance and, and all life-saving humanitarian assistance, that is not subject to the current assistance pause. Uh, the assistance pause at the moment um, as we evaluate the next steps for Sudan programming, uh, implicates uh, the $700 million in emergency economic support funds, or ESF funds, uh, that we spoke to uh, yesterday. Um, all of this assistance, uh, and we spoke to this at some length yesterday, uh, is of course provided consistent with the applicable restrictions, including those restrictions that have been in place on Sudan uh, since um, uh, the uh, military coup uh, which was applied to Sudan in 1989 when the former Bashir regime uh, rose to power. Uh, a follow up on that. Um, uh, Prime Minister Hamdok, has the United States, have any, has, has the United States had any contact with him uh, since, since the takeover? We are pressing uh, for the Prime Minister's release. We are pressing for the release of other uh, civilian leaders uh, who have been detained uh, since the start uh, of the military's uh, takeover. Uh, communications, I should say, in Sudan have been difficult, especially in Khartoum. There have been internet blackouts. There have been uh, restrictions 
uh, when it comes to uh, phone usage. So communications has uh, communications have been difficult. Um, we don't have any um, uh, discussions with Prime Minister Hemdok or, or other members of civilian uh, government uh, to read out, um, but we are continuing to press uh, every uh, appropriate lever uh, for their release. Do you, um, the, um, General Burhan was saying that he's been well treated, that he's at his home. Uh, do you have any, any, um, any indication of whether the Prime Minister has been treated well? Uh, I will say what I said yesterday, and that is now that the Prime Minister, now that other members of the civilian-led transitional government remain in military custody, it is the military's responsibility to ensure that they are treated well, uh, to ensure their safety, to ensure their security, to ensure uh, their health. Uh, I don't have any updates to provide, but we are watching very closely uh, to uh, see to it uh, that the military does just that. Just, just one. Well, we'll finish that with Sean, and we'll just, we'll just, just one. Sorry, just one briefly. Um, uh, the rule of Omar al Bashir, um, the uh, the idea of, of handing him over for uh, on the, the the charges that he's been uh, been accused of. Uh, is the United States uh, hopeful that he'll still be handed over? Or is that something that's coming to dash because of this? Uh, look, we're in the very early uh, hours of this. It's just been uh, over a day. So uh, these are questions uh, that will have to be decided in the coming days. Certainly, um, we look to, uh, and we have supported, um, holding uh, members of the former regime, including uh, Omar al-Bashir, uh, accountable um, for uh, past wrongs. So, I, I, I do you know where his whereabouts? Do we know where Can Omar al-Bashir is? Hamdok's uh, uh, where, whereabouts. Yeah. Uh, look, it, it is... Um, uh, whether he really is in good health and alive. It is, it is not for us to speak to these questions publicly. It is for us to underscore the point that the military has a responsibility now that he remains in their custody, uh, now that the Minister of Religious Affairs, Mufare, and others remain in their custody. The military has a responsibility to ensure they are treated well, uh, to ensure they remain in good health, uh, and to ensure their security. Yes? Um, the UN Secretary General of the Affairs is, um, in response to this situation in Sudan, uh, talked about an epidemic of coup d'etats. You know, he's talking about this broader situation. Obviously, this is happening as in the time that you guys, since the Biden administration took power with a, you know, a focus on democracy and human rights. Um, so. I wonder if you wanted to kind of respond to his appeal to big powers, you know, including the United States, um, for unity at the Security Council to have more effective deterrence. And do you agree that there is a lack of deterrence that seems to be leading to countries, you know, militaries like Sudan, Myanmar, other countries as well, uh, to take these kind of actions? Well, I, I am not aware, and in fact, I am very confident that the Secretary General I uh, uh, was making any sort of causal link between this administration and uh, some of the anti-democratic actions that we've seen. I think uh, the, uh, sec the, the Secretary General, I think the international community, uh, our allies and partners in the international community uh, would recognize that uh, the United States and the United States under this administration, uh, we have been a forceful and powerful advocate uh, for democracy, uh, for human rights, for universal rights. Uh, we have um, made clear where we stand uh, and with whom we stand uh, in many different fora, including uh, at the UN. Uh, as you know, we will be pulling together an unprecedented uh, event in the coming weeks, the Summit for Democracy, uh, where we'll have a chance with, uh, together uh, with many of the world's, um, many of our democratic partners from around the world uh, to uh, share experiences, to um, uh, learn from one another, uh, and to, to do what we can uh, to beat back uh, the tide of uh, authoritarianism, of uh, repression, uh, wherever it exists. Uh, you, were, you were right that we have seen setbacks uh, in uh, countries, uh, in certain countries. Uh, Sudan is, is the latest of that. Uh, but when it comes to Sudan, uh, when it comes to Burma, uh, when it comes to other countries where we have seen worrying trends, uh, no country has done more, no country has said more, no country has afforded more to the people in terms of humanitarian assistance and humani humanitarian aid uh, than the uh, United States. And so whether it's Sudan, whether it's Burma, uh, whether it is uh, countries where 
um, anti-democratic uh, forces uh, may be gaining more influence. Uh, we will continue uh, to lead that charge. Uh, we will continue to work to galvanize uh, our allies and our partners around the world uh, to make very clear uh, where the United States uh, and where uh, those with whom we share interests and values, and that is a large part of the world, where we stand. Yes. Uh, so in terms of um, holding accountable those responsible for uh, what we have seen, what we may yet see, look, we have been very clear uh, that the United States uh, and our allies and partners uh, will use every appropriate tool to see to it that we can help Sudan uh, reemerge on uh, the path to democracy. Uh, to put it, uh, put a finer point on it, uh, we will do everything we can to support the democratic aspirations of the Sudanese people uh, and to see to it uh, that we can do everything uh, to help them uh, achieve uh, and to realize uh, those aspirations, uh, which have been uh, set back, of course, uh, by what we have seen the military do uh, over the course of uh, the past 36 uh, or so uh, hours. When it comes to what we call this, this is very clearly a military takeover. Um, yesterday we spoke about um, uh, the historical um, uh, context here. Um, what is true is that we are closely monitoring uh, the events in Sudan. Uh, we know that the military has hijacked the, trans the democratic transition. Uh, these actions to seize power are unacceptable. They are a contravention of Sudan's constitutional declaration, uh, which along with the Juba Peace Agreement is the agreed framework. Uh, for the democratic transition. These are the documents that embody uh, the democratic aspirations of the Sudanese people, and that's why uh, we are standing by them. Now, when it comes to uh, this particular term, the, the coup, Sudan has been subject to the military coup restriction uh, in Section 7008 of the Department's Annual Appropriations Act, um, and it has been subject to those restrictions, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, since the Bashir regime uh, came to power undemocratically uh, in 1989. Uh, Sudan will be subject, continue to be subject to those restrictions uh, until the Secretary determines that a democratically elected government uh, has taken office, and that's what we'll continue to uh, support. Yes? One more. Sure. When sure. do you think the, uh, the U.S. aid is going to be returned to Sudan? I'm sorry, when, did I, when do we the think? The assistance that um, um, you mentioned, when do you think it will be returned them. Well, uh, so to be to be very clear and to, to go back to, to Matt's question, our humanitarian assistance yes. uh, is ongoing. Uh, and uh, even in countries where we have uh, profound violent disagreements uh, with, the, um, with the government, uh, we continue to support uh, the basic humanitarian needs of a country's people. Uh, what we have uh, paused as we are uh, continuing to uh, assess and to determine our, our next steps um, is the $700 million uh, in uh, bilateral uh, and bilateral assistance. Hey, yes. The, the problem is that it changes, or the interpretation changes from administration to administration. Is it this administration, is it your understanding that this administration's legal determination is that it can't be a coup, or it isn't a coup, if the government ousted was not an elected one? I, I, or or, 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 or can a coup replace, can it be yep. a coup if, if what happens replaces a government that came to power in a coup? Uh, I am always loath to weigh in on legal questions from the podium, but uh, the shorthand answer, Matt, as I understand it, is that um, according to um, uh, our analysis, um, the what you uh, the the first iteration of what you said is accurate uh, because the Bashir regime I don't what my be, because, was. because the Bashir regime uh, did not come to power democratically and the and its replacement led by Hamdok was not democratically elected correct so a coup determination is moot that's correct but you know so in Burma you had a situation where Suu Kyi herself 
was not elected uh, by anyone. So although the government had been the, the state councilor or whatever her title was exactly, she, she was not elected. She was chosen by them, by, by her party. But by a party that was brought to power democratically. <clears throat> so, your, so, so the legal determination is that in that case, even if the figurehead leader is, so in other words, if, 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 if it was just Suu Kyi who had been removed, then I, it wouldn't have been a coup? These are, uh, these sort of uh, ex post facto it, hypotheticals it, are, are uh, look, well, um, I, I, mean, I, <laughs> I, I just want to know if you guys have made, if this administration's um, rationale for determining whether something is a coup or not has changed from pre from, from there from there what, what I will say is there was a constant. there was a coup determination that was conducted in the immediate aftermath yeah. uh, of the early February 2021 coup in Burma right. uh, this uh, department uh, determined in short order uh, given the circumstances the facts and the analysis of them on the ground uh, that what had transpired in Burma was a coup in the case of Sudan um, of course, uh, these are these are apples and oranges. We inherited. Uh, we have a very different situation um, with the military overthrowing uh, a regime that was not democratically uh, put in place. Yes. I cannot confirm, but if it is true, how do you comment on that? I, I, I haven't seen these reports. It sounds like they're just emerging. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have been calling for the military to release the prime minister, uh, to release the minister of religious affairs, to release other uh, members of the civilian government. Uh, I don't want to weigh in until uh, I've seen confirmation of that. Yes. Uh, uh, now, uh, many officials and uh, a lot of people said it is not too late to reverse the cause of events in Sudan. But after yesterday's event, do you foresee an active role for Al Burhan in a democratic Sudan? And I want to follow up on that. Look, uh, right now we are focused on uh, helping the Sudanese people achieve a restoration of their democratic aspirations. Uh, that is what we are focused on right now. We can tackle questions uh, of uh, what that might look like, uh, what the implications of this are uh, in the days ahead. Right now, uh, we and our allies and our partners uh, were focused on, uh, as I said before, uh, a few things. Uh, that is an immediate release of all political actors detained in connection uh, with these events, a full restoration of the civilian-led government, uh, ensuring, uh, doing all we can uh, to protect uh, peaceful protesters, ensuring they're not subject uh, to violence, including the use uh, of live uh, fire uh, and ammunition. That is our, uh, that's our focus right and now. Just yes. to follow sure. up, please, I will, I will follow up on the question asked before. What happened in Sudan took place the minute a U.S. special envoy left the country. And that says something about your influence, the U.S. ability to influence the event. Uh, this is not reassuring to your friends. I, what, I, what implication of that on on the U.S. role and influence around the world? So I, I, I want to be uh, clear on a couple points here. Number one, uh, Ambassador Feltman uh, was in Sudan, had been in Sudan uh, in, in recent days. Um, we were, of course, uh, not given any uh, pre-notification uh, by the military or others that they plan these anti-democratic actions. Had we, uh, we would have made very clear uh, where the United States would and now does stand uh, in response uh, to any such uh, plans. Uh, but uh, there's something of a chicken and an egg issue here. Uh, Ambassador Feltman uh, was in the region. Uh, he had been in contact um, over the course of the previous weeks uh, with many in the region precisely because uh, we had seen indications that uh, Sudan's democratic transition uh, was potentially running into trouble. Uh, that uh, there were uh, individuals uh, who might seek to subvert uh, that democratic path. Uh, so these were conversations um, that uh, had been going on uh, for some time. Uh, we had emphasized that the actions to, um, any actions to subvert uh, the democratic transition are unacceptable, would, uh, are a contravention of uh, the constitutional declaration. Uh, which again, along with the uh, Juba peace agreement, uh, is the agreed framework for uh, a democratic transition. Yes. Um, on Iran. 
Anything else on Sudan before we move on? Uh, quickly, sure. Allies in the region and around the world on Sudan. I'm just wondering what direct engagement you've had with the military leadership since the takeover. Obviously, Ambassador Feldman was was there just before. Uh, so, uh, of course, in the uh, days, weeks, months leading up to this, um, we had engaged with uh, the full range of uh, political society um, in Sudan, including the civilian and the military leadership. Um, uh, since then, we have been focused on discussing, comparing notes, achieving a unified position uh, with our partners and allies uh, in the region, in the broader Middle East, and, and around the world. Uh, I am not aware of any conversations that have taken place uh, with the military leadership uh, since the actions of uh, late Sunday, our time Monday, uh, in Khartoum. Uh, if we feel that it would be constructive, that if it would be useful uh, to help achieve the uh, objective that we and our partners have set out, and that is a restoration uh, of the democratic aspirations of the Sudanese people, a restoration of the civilian-led transitional government, if we feel that engagement, direct engagement, uh, with uh, a military leader would be useful. Uh, we, we, wouldn't, um, we wouldn't shy away from doing that, um, but at this point, we haven't done that yet. Uh, yes, uh, Iran, sure. On Iran, uh, the talk of the refueling gas stations in Iran was uh, disrupted by what the government says is a cyber attack, cyber attack. Was the U.S. in any way associated with this attack, or were they aware this attack was going to take place? And if so, is this any sort of warning about returning to the talks in Vienna? I, what I will say on returning to the talks in Vienna um, is that we've been very clear uh, that uh, the path for diplomacy remains open. Uh, we continue to believe, our partners in the P5 plus one continue to believe that diplomacy constitutes the most effective means to once again ensure that Iran is verifiably and permanently prevented uh, from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Uh, but I don't have any uh, response to, uh, to the first part of your question. Uh, yes, Ben. Uh, thank you, Ned. I have a question on Taiwan and then on North Korea. Uh, the first is regarding the press release today from the Secretary regarding Taiwan's participation in the UN system. I was just wondering about the timing of the release and whether it had anything, wh whether it coincided with this uh, 50th anniversary of the UN resolution. So uh, yesterday, as I believe, was the 50th anniversary of, of the UN resolution. Uh, but the statement uh, made a broader point. Uh, and the statement made a point uh, that we support uh, to Taiwan's ability to participate meaningfully at the UN uh, and to contribute its valuable expertise uh, to address many of the global challenges we face. Uh, that includes global public health, the environment, climate change, uh, development assistance, technical standards, uh, and economic uh, cooperation as well. Uh, we reiterate, reiterated our commitment to Taiwan's meaningful participation at the World Health Organization and the UN Framework for uh, Convention on Climate Change, uh, and uh, we will continue to support uh, Taiwan's meaningful participation in such forum. But was there a specific reason why you decided to put that out today? Or? Why we decided to put it out today? It, it is a, a statement of our support for Taiwan's meaningful participation. Uh, in these institutions, and, and as you noted, there was an important anniversary. And then on North... And I realize that you want to go back to strategic ambiguity after the President's comments last week, but when you say meaningful, does that mean independent of Beijing? Uh, it means meaningful. It means substantive. I, yeah, well, you know what? Means meaningful <laughs> and substantive doesn't really... It's, that, that, that's kind of useless. It's, to, it, it doesn't mean anything. It, it, what it means... What, what, well, what, what, what it, what meaningful it, means nothing in this case if you don't explain what it is you mean by meaning. What it, what it means uh, is that Taiwan as uh, a leading democracy... Um, yes, uh, but Taiwan. does that mean, in your view, does that mean that they get to, that they should participate in UN fora or other international fora as Taiwan, as Chinese Taipei, or as some kind of adjunct to whatever delegation Beijing sends to these meetings? Uh, what it means is that we believe that Taiwan has uh, important knowledge, expertise, uh, insight, and perspective uh, to lend within these uh, institutions uh, in a way that is appropriate and meaningful well, and will continue the uh, to stand with that by is, that. The problem is, is that Sorry. no one knows what that means, and it just creates more confusion 
and 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 makes and makes 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 the situation Matt, worse. Matt, we Do you not we, get that? We we put out an entire statement in the secretary's name on this Sorry. yesterday. I think that a sta that statement Today, was abundantly this morning. This morning, you're right. I was abundantly clear. Sighting. Uh, sure. I'll say, yes. Go ahead. Um, there have been some press reports that North Korea would send a delegation to COP26 uh, later this week. Uh, does the State Department plan to have any meetings with any North Korean delegation? Are you open to meeting with them if they're there? I, I am not aware. Um, uh, first of all, I would have to refer you to Pyongyang to speak to uh, any plans they may have to participate uh, in Glasgow uh, next week. I uh, certainly am not aware of uh, any plans that we have uh, uh, at the moment to engage uh, with any delegation from the DPRK. What we have said um, broadly when it comes to uh, the DPRK is that we believe diplomacy uh, is the most effective means by which uh, to achieve what it is that our policy review identified as that overarching goal, and that's a complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, we are open uh, to diplomacy. Uh, we are ready for diplomacy. We have made clear to the DPRK uh, that we have no hostile intent uh, towards uh, the country, that uh, we are prepared uh, to engage uh, diplomatically with them. We've made that uh, very clear uh, in a series of, of, of messages, uh, and we, uh, we await a response. Yes, Saeed. Uh, but before I do that, I want to add my name and acknowledging Gladys and what she's done over the years. And I want to wish her Godspeed and the best luck in the road ahead. She will definitely be missed. Thank you, Saeed, yes. Yeah. Uh, on the settlement, you know, the Israelis announced on Sunday that they, they, or they, they in fact, issued tenders to build 1,300 settlements in seven different uh, settlements and so on. I know in the past you have expressed your, your, your views and you, you told us in this room you know, an issue that I asked so many times about that your position on the settlement is well known. But what message are you sending the Israelis? Uh, because I think that Israel feels emboldened by your lack of resolve on this issue. By, sorry, could you repeat the last part of the question? I said Israel is emboldened by, you know, they, they, they keep doing things, you express, you know, that you, you know, you, you disagree with, the, with this action, and they go on. They are emboldened by your lack of action. Uh, Said, we've had an opportunity to discuss our position on this uh, in this room and in any number uh, of uh, other occasions. Uh, when it comes to what we've heard recently, uh, we are deep. You've been listening to State Department Press Secretary Ned Price. He also uh, he addressed the ongoing situation in Sudan, saying the U.S. is speaking with allies and neighbors right. to make Thank sure democracy is restored like there. But we're going to pivot now to Capitol Hill, where Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is speaking to reporters. Let's we're listen. We're still working, and we are closer uh, to reaching a final agreement on President Biden's Build Back Better plan. As you all know, I traveled to Delaware on Sunday to meet with the President and with Senator Manchin about our agenda. We had a very good, productive conversation uh, there. and. Um, we continue to move forward and continue to have good conversations through the weekend and up to right now. I believe that we will get this done, and we will get it done soon. I know that Democrats in both chambers are working really hard to get this consequential, desperately needed legislation across the finish line. No one ever told us, no one ever said, that passing transformational legislation like this would be easy but we are on track to get it done because it's so important and it's what the American people need and what they want. And I want to focus on the impact on Americans, working class Americans, middle class Americans, poor Americans, those struggling to get into the middle class and those trying to stay there. The challenges our country faces now are significant. The world has changed so rapidly and we have to deal with those changes and make people's lives better and easier that is our mission. Things are a struggle today for 75, 80 percent of Americans. Only those at the top have the wherewithal to deal with all the new changes on their own. So this is not just some legislative fight happening in Congress. The bill we're working on is very desperately needed by hardworking Americans and will help Americans for generations to come. Millions of Americans